Very well then, let's delve straight into our discussions this morning as tailored around headline stories earlier captured in our overview of the newspaper review segment. I'm not doing this alone, I'm joined by our in-house analyst and reviewer for today, Barrister Mike Adinye. Good morning to you, sir. Good morning, good morning. The pleasure is mine. Now, we had talked about uh, the retirement of the CJN, Justice Ariola, and with commendations coming in from President Bola Metinibu on what he calls a successful public service, would also be the swearing-in of uh, Justice Kekere Kun today. Now, we'll look at how this shifts the dynamics, talking about the role of the CJN uh, and what this entails for the judiciary going into the future of Nigeria. Uh, how would you, on the one hand, rate the performance of the outgoing CJN Justice Ariwola, and what are your hopes for the incoming CJN Kekere Kun? Well, uh, you know, Nigeria has been in uh, troubled uh, waters over the years, and uh, so far so good. I think the outgone, outgoing CJN uh, did its best to manage the system so that we did not snowball into a crisis situation in the country. Uh, we hope that uh, his uh, leaving office today will uh, leave an indelible mark that will be followed by the incoming CJN. Uh, it's the first time we are having this, uh, uh, not uh, one of the f best anyway, that we're having this uh, smooth, uh, uh, swift change of button, you know, from uh, the head to the immediate, uh, uh, the in the military, we call it the two IC. You know, it's a good thing. Let's see how we can, uh, you know, get the ball rolling. And uh, what matters most to us, even in the judiciary, is that uh, we get, a co we get, you know, we were able to establish a country where everybody will be well represented and Nigeria will be well managed you know, to overcome the crisis situation we found ourselves over the years, including the present moment, because we're in a very serious uh, dilemma of, of our willingness, uh, you know, to live together as an indivisible entity. Now, let's talk about the relationship between the three arms of governments under the current dispensation. It may seem as though, according to some assertions as obtainable in public opinion, that President Bola Metinibu has somewhat prioritized the judiciary. We've seen an increment of the wages and take home of judicial officers. We've seen promptness given to the appointment of a new CJN and some other gestures towards the judiciary that lead many to make that assertion. Do you also buy into that opinion? And is this actually the case? Yes, uh, you know, this is the first time in our history, our recent history, where we've had a smooth uh, takeover. Because prior to this time, you get recommendations from uh, NJC to either be returned or challenged in some way or the other. But this time around, since it's a smooth sale and we're having an immediate swearing in of the new, of the successor, it goes to show that uh, the, the president has a uh, belief in the judiciary and wants to work on the with the judiciary. Well, I think it's so far so good. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, let's have it done so that uh, there will be no vacuum at the end of the day. You know, we need continuity as far as the judiciary is concerned. That's what matters most to us as a people, even as lawyers, although I'm a lawyer too. Uh, you know, I'm an advocate of a smooth and swift change of button, which uh, the president has adhered to. But for the increment in uh, wages and salaries of judicial officers, I think it's the best thing that's happened to us as a people, even as lawyers, because in some uh, times we hear people talk about compromises and all that in the judiciary, probably, you know, probably because they were not well, the judiciary was not well funded. But we still need uh, better autonomy, although the president is doing his best. He has taken a good step by increasing their salaries or making sure that the judicial officers or uh, the, the bench, you know, is well taken care of. It's a good uh, sense, you know, a good uh, direction so far. So far, so good. Now, in terms of strengthening the judiciary, as you hope that this would also entail, have been other motions people have questioned as to how strong the rule of law in Nigeria is. We saw a ruling on the local government autonomy. And just the other day, in the studios here, persons were asking the question of why there needs to be a committee as constituted by the SGF to ensure that this judgment is being followed with to the latter. Do you think that in the dynamics of how the rule of law is viewed in Nigeria, this is quite a telling time going into the future of how the judiciary 
and the rule of law will be received in Nigeria? Well, you know, if you look at uh, the way we have moved over time or snowballed into that present state, you discover that uh, it's uh, been an aberration in terms of uh, adherence to judicial pronouncements or judgments of the court. You know, and that has equally affected us badly, especially in the past of the outgone government, the uh, erstwhile government of uh, Muhammad Ubuari. There was a total disrespect you know, of the judiciary by the Buhari led administration, which uh, affected us. And most, in most cases, some persons lost hope and confidence in the judiciary because of what happened. At that time, it was when judgments favored the government that they would swiftly move into it. But if it does not favor them, or if it did not favor them, they would abandon the, judi the judgment and ask you to do whatever you can do. And nothing can be done. You know, it goes to show that uh, at that level, the judiciary was swept under the carpet. There was nothing like independence of the judiciary. But uh, with the way our manner this government is going, it goes to show that uh, the government is quite sensitive to the earnings of Nigerians and uh, the judiciary should not be left out. In terms of uh, separation of powers and checks and balances, it has not been very well practiced in Nigeria because uh, when a, a particular arm of government is supposed to be independent, it's subservient to the other government because the executive, let me be, be direct, is... Uh, you know, responsible for its uh, financial obligations. You know, you, you it's a he who pays the piper, he pays the tune. The common is commonly said. But if we can have a judiciary that is independent and it's that is self-made, you know, that is grooming itself, we have an institution that is independent, devoid of unnecessary interferences by government agencies. You know, that will uh, get better, and everybody will be happy at the end of the day. Now, let's just remind our viewers as well as we continue a review of some headline features. The Attorney General of the Federation also made comments on the position of the federal government not to tolerate any subversive actions of the, the democratic government being enjoyed. This was earlier captured on the Daily Times and the Nation newspapers. Let's revisit their front pages just to keep everyone carried along. Now, on the front page of the Daily Times, you'd find that lead story. FG would not tolerate subversion of democratic government, says AGF. A similarity in that lead focus is also captured on the nation newspaper. No room for subversive move, federal government wants. Now, citing the provisions in the constitution of what is known as a treasonable felony is also a link to this comment to, would I say, uh, a lack of honor for the invitation handed over to the NLC president, Comrade Joe Ajero. Uh, his uh, representative, uh, human rights lawyer, Femi Falana, SAN, had said he'll be only available to appear on the 27th. And this comment of the AGF have somehow, by these two papers, been linked to the Ajero situation. Let's get your thoughts on how this constitutes the subversive actions and the position of treasonable felony in some of the allegations leveled against Comrade Ajero. Uh, you know, although uh, when uh, we heard or read that... Uh uh, Algeria the NLC president was accused of uh, is it terrorism financing? You know, it, to me, I, I try to link it to the situation at hand. Probably, you know, government over time has uh, devised this means of uh, giving a bad name because we want to nail it. I have not seen, although the matter is uh, ongoing right now, uh, it's not in court yet, would have said it's a uh, subjudice. Um, I don't think uh, there's anything much. They are feeling that he's being intimidated because of the role he played in the NSAS or in bad government, you know, that took place and some comments by some Nigerians. Because I'm, I'm aware of the fact that uh, NLC had uh, made a comment that uh, should anything happen to their president, that uh, they will ground this government. I'm sure that is it's based on that premise that uh, the AGF is making that uh, pronouncement. Nothing short of that. But if uh, Algeria is uh, entitled to a lawyer, it's supposed to be represented by a lawyer, no matter the situation or circumstances. But we should uh, trade with caution because should anything happen to him at this time, definitely the government and the country will be grounded by NLC because I don't see the government working independently without the NLC. So they should be very, very careful in handling this matter. If that is what his uh, lawyer had said, you know, it's not something that uh, will expire with the affliction of time. He should be given that benefit of that while uh, Femi Falana, who wants to bring him personally, probably his lawyer is not chance right now. He wants to make sure that he comes with him to face the government no matter what, you know. It's a dicey situation that the government should be very careful about if we must have to move, you know, as a country and as a government at this critical time of ours. Now, in this situation, we looked at some reactions on social media as well to these developments. Persons are beginning to ask the question of, are some individuals bigger than institutions? 
They also referenced the former governor of Kogi State, Alaji Ayabelo, who was invited and up until now has not honored that invitation. It almost seems as though it's a reoccurring decimal that some persons owing to their position or status in society have the privilege of not honoring invitation by law enforcement agencies even when some allegations as wavy as those leveled against the individuals are in question. Uh, how does the Nigerian society uh, be seen to be just and free and fair? Okay, there are two, there are two different uh, scenes here. The uh, former governor of uh, Kogi State is accused of uh, diversion of funds, money laundry and all that, which is a very, very different case from Ajero's case. That one is, I know there was some attempt to arrest him and he escaped or so, probably because uh, his governor assisted him to do that, which uh, to me was an aberration, an error. You know, if uh, he's not afraid of uh, his shadows, he should come to face, uh, you know, you know, you, you know, you cannot be condemned without being heard, and no man is guilty based on our jurisprudence without being heard. You know, we have the authoritarian party in the Nigerian in Kasa, so you have the right to be heard. No government can condemn you, or government agency or institution can be. Heard. You can be invited at any time. Even the president can be invited, or the immunity covers him. He can be invited, you know, over gray areas, or if he's needed to attend to particular issues, you know, that are, you know, probably brought to the public domain, which. Uh, we need to work on. But as it is right now, I don't think uh, Yaya Bello is above the law. Whatever he is or wherever he is or whatever he has done, he should come to account. He should come and give his account of uh, stewardship or what he did uh, you know, during his stay as the governor of Kogi State. But for Ajero's case, he has not said he will, will not come. He has the right to be represented by a lawyer of his choice. And that is why he has said, okay, I'm coming at a particular date. He didn't say he will not come, he will not come. So he is coming, let the government be patient with him because he represents an institution which is NLC and which is very sensitive to this government. Should anything happen to him that is seen to be an aberration or not, where it is discovered that the rule of law is not uh, strictly followed, it will uh, dent the image of this uh, government and it will not go well for us as a, you know, as a people or as a country, especially looking at the... Uh, what we're experiencing right now as a country. Now, now, for context sake, and just to carry the larger view in public along, subversion of democratic government in terms of actions by either individuals, group, or civil society organizations, for context sake, what constitutes subversion of democratic governance? Okay, now what that means is that when the rule, I mean the principles or the, these processes of expressing your anger or your grievances is not followed, when you take the laws into your hands, or you go contrary to the precepts and dictates of the law, that is a subversion. For instance, if you are supposed to come by proper means, you know, to express your anger or ventilate your anger, and you go through a different means, you're subverting institutions of uh, government that have been put in place or set up to manage this crisis situation. Okay, now let's put it in context of the hashtag end bad governance, because we did see uh, an order obtained from the courts restricting the protesters to certain venues and persons were asking besides the provisions in the constitution 1999 as amended which gives nigerians the right to protest, protest that's right that uh would i say uh infringement on the provisions for venues is it tantamount to subversion of uh, uh democratic governance and the provisions of the law i don't think you know this government uh, or even the pre previous governments have often relied on a propagandist uh, machinery to express their decision or actions or inaction per time. The fact that uh, every man has a right to movement as a Nigerian means that they should not be restricted. They know why. Probably it's because of uh, what we've experienced in the past. Our antecedents you know, shows that uh, in most crisis situations in this country, or protests, or, you know, people leave the aims and objectives of the protest and go into looting properties or destroy vandalizing properties of government, which is contrary. That is part of the subversion we're talking about. If you want to express yourself because you are grieved, you know, with the government over certain policies of government, you are allowed to protest. You can carry placards. The fact that you have the right to protest does not mean that you have the right to destroy properties of government or properties of uh, innocent Nigerians who were not privy to whatever misgovernance that is being taken place or where the protest, protesters are protesting against. That is what the government is kicking against. And that's why they've not allowed it. In situations like uh, if people decide to go and protest or strike and they go about destroying uh, assets of government, who would replace them? That is the subversion we're talking about. That no government will fold its arms, arms, arms and watch individuals or citizens of this country go about destroying things or go about uh, or stop, or in some cases they try to stop those who want to go about their 
businesses. You know, they prevent them, fight them, lock them, beat them up, kill loot them, their shops loot their well. shops and all that. That is what the AGF is uh, referring to by the government, not uh, folding his arms and watching uh, the citizens go haywire. Well, I hope Barrister Mike Adinge's uh, explanation helps put the context in position as we reiterate the calls from the Attorney General of the Federation, Latif Agbemi, who has vowed that the federal government would not tolerate any subversive actions in terms of the democratic governance being enjoyed in Nigeria by the actions of any individual, groups, or organizations. Now, whilst this is a story of concern, another pressing issue is in Niger State, where there has been killings and the government has moved to ban mining activities in Shiroro. Now, The Guardian had earlier depicted the story with a caricature leading its headline stories with insurgency in the Northeast Corridor. Let's revisit the front page of The Guardian as we look to get Barrister Mike's opinion on this development as well. Now, in telling the story following the federal government's order to security agents to track foreign miners for funding, funding banditry, you'd find the catchphrase insurgency in the Northeast. Thousands in dire straits as support dries up in border towns. Now, there were 12 miners killed as well in this development. A lot of persons, like the caricature depicts, are now in IDP camps. And it's been a recurrent situation in Niger State and other communities that have some valuable mineral resources that are either being mined illegally or foreigners are said to be funding disputes and killings in such areas to be able to tap the minerals without the knowledge of the federal government. You know, in Nigeria, it's a... Like uh, who said Nigeria is a geographical expression. We do not have a proper database in this country. It's difficult to determine who is who or who comes in and who doesn't come in. I take note of the fact that at some point in time in our history, the borders were left open. And some of these, some of these foreigners come into this country unhindered, you know, unabated to do some of these uh, atrocities in this country. And because they have the resources, you know, to lure Nigerians, you know, these Nigerians to perpetrate their evil intentions, even though ordinarily it's supposed to be for their personal economic benefit against the interests of the country. But if we have proper checks on the borders and if the, proper, the borders are properly manned by the immigration officers or institutions that are, respons that are responsible for such a border control, I think some of these things can be checked. But uh, Nigeria is in a sorry state right now, sorry to say it. But because uh, if we've reached a situation where everybody wants to survive. There's this jostling, survival of the fittest. Who takes what, when, and how? You know, this is something that Karl Marx had talked about in, a, you know, in his Communist Manifesto a long time ago. That we'll get to a point where uh, the resources of government will be diverted by those who do not have for their own benefit against government policies. And should there be an attempt to prevent them from carrying out some of these things, they will decide to fight the government. Where in the resources of the state, we're taken over by the by this, uh, they call it the capitalists and the proletariat. We're taken over by the proletariat and used for their benefit. Where each member of the society is made to work according to his ability and is paid according to his needs. We're in a sorry state right now. Everybody wants to survive by whatever means, irrespective of what it takes, even at the expense of their lives. That's the situation we're experiencing now because Nigeria is actually in a sorry state. Now, what do we do about this sorry state in perspective of? some of the institutions of government saddled to check the spaces. We have a solid minerals minister. We have a ministry dedicated. But we keep on hearing the catchphrases of ungovernable spaces and untouchable persons when it comes to mining activities in such areas. Even the mining sector itself has some cabal that are actually controlling it. There are some persons who feel that above the law and shouldn't be touched. And because government cannot be everywhere, you cannot deploy everybody everywhere per time. And that is why some of these persons who appear to be stronger than the government or who probably have relationships or probably have access to some key officers you know, occupying uh, sensitive positions in this country. They cannot touch them because of sentimental application of laws in this country. Most, most times when laws are applied, they are applied differently irrespective of what the constitution talks about. And no man should be discriminated based on the circumstances of his birth or whatever he has, or wherever he has found it himself at time. Now some persons who feel that untouchable, that's why uh, justice uh, in Nigeria, as it appears right now, is for sale, unless for certain institutions that have outgrown this and trying to see how they check the excesses in the judiciary. Well, it's a, I think it's, Nigeria is evolving. We are gradually getting to where everything will be strengthened. But one thing I think uh, the government should do is that uh, put economic uh, policies in place, 
that will help the country survive because things are actually very difficult in the country right now. And the government appears to be helpless at this point in time because most policies that have been adopted by government at this time are what I will call a trial and error. They try this, if it doesn't work, they go this way. You can, so you can see even the value of the Naira to, tomorrow, you hear that it's fluctuating. The value has gone down, has gone up, has gone down. You know, we cannot continue this way. How did other countries, especially African countries, survive this present condition? I think we, a lot needs to be done by this government because uh, we were actually in a sorry state. Now let's look at the economic implications of this as we look to wrap up on this discussion, especially in relation to banditry and its effect on revenue loss to the government. Now many say if we can tap some of the revenue that accrues from mining, come on, some other African countries, that's their well, main mining, thing. Yeah, that's right. So, so how does the government show up these losses in its revenue? It's actually a terrible thing because there are some places that even the government officials cannot get to. You know, it gets to a level where even policemen who are posted to, to man these areas get involved in some of this illegality because they too have to survive the Nigerians. You will not uh, be around me and be living a very flamboyant life and I'm seeing out there suffering. They key into it. Some of them lobby to be posted to these areas where ordinarily they are supposed to prevent uh, or check the excesses of some of these persons in this area, especially when there are government uh, policies in place to check excesses, the excesses of uh, some people who infiltrate this country, some foreigners. The government too needs uh, need to wake up. It have increased the, uh, the, the tactics of the policing system in the country or make sure that uh, some of these immigration officers are posted to you know, key areas and not allow foreigners to infiltrate, to infiltrate this country with their resources because they can always afford to pay their way through, to pay that the government or the security agencies or pay some of these Nigerians that they use as laborers to carry out their nefarious activities. That's the only way we can go about this because the government too must be sensitive to the earnings of Nigerians to be able to tackle some of these uh, indices or some of these vices affecting our growth you know and uh, development as a people when you look at the uh, banditry too that's another terrible uh, situation right now because farmers can no longer go to farm the government officials can no longer go to check some of these things because of the fear of uh, bandits because I know that I'm aware of the fact that in some places especially in Niger state bandits have uh, taken over some areas as a result of which uh, government or security agencies cannot get to such areas to check the activities going on there. And even in some villages, people pay royalty, they pay taxes to bandits. So how do you, you manage it? You cannot government. have a territory within a territory. You cannot have a, a country within a country, or a government within a government. That is what is affecting us, you know, as a people. If insecurity is properly copped or checked in Nigeria, we'll be better off and uh, every Nigerian will be happy for it. Well, it's the hope that with our fight against insurgency, banditry and terrorism in parts of the country, particularly in the Northeast, uh, where in Niger State, bandits have killed 12 persons and the federal government is vowing to track the foreigners who are said to be associated with funding banditry so as to benefit from the mineral deposits in such states. Now, in keeping with more of the reviews of stories greet our front pages is the sad report of the murder of Serkin Gobir. Now, two papers earlier also reported this in that perspective. We found reports on the Leadership Friday and on the Daily Trust. We'll revisit them as we look to get more insights. On the Leadership Friday, the lead story read, Northern elders fret over kidnap killing of Modak, of monarchs, condemns murder of Serkin Gobir. Situation worrisome, says Abbas, Governor Liu. North must find solutions to insecurity now says Shehusani. The Daily Trust has some strong accusations in its lead story, talking about the situation in Kaduna as Kaduna villagers accuse soldiers of killing three persons, a hundred cows. Now, the dynamics of how this plays out most times with accusations and counter-accusations uh, are more so worrisome. Now, it's almost as if though the traditional tools are targeted in some states and then we find Kaduna villagers accusing soldiers of killing three persons and a hundred cows. Nothing held us fret over killing of monarchs. It's a terrible thing. How would a monarch be killed? You know, when growing up as a child, we're made to understand that uh, some of these monarchs in the north have these, uh, you know, godly, how do you call it, accolades, you know, that are given these uh, position to portray them as gods and therefore their emergence is divine. But if you've reached a situation where monarchs are killed, it shows that there's an error. 
what 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 will happen? How were they killed? Is it an internal thing? Because I know it's in most cases difficult for foreigners to come in or to infiltrate a particular society and kill the monarch, unless there is an insider arrangement or informant within, you know, the the monarchy, you know, that would lead to that. Probably, the person is interested in that. But what would have led to that? It's no, no matter what it takes. I don't think that uh, the life of uh, a Nigerian is what. Uh, you know, being taken by bandits because we cannot sit back as a people and allow some of these things to happen. Where is the security? What happened? What happened to the security men in that vicinity? What happened? Is it that they were not there? Or did they, were they not posted? What happened? It's a difficult thing to, you know, some of these things have happened in the north in such a way that it has become, it has become a recurrent uh, situation and they're not where people come and kill on you know without any trees or you know whatever for how long shall this continue the not should look inward police themselves I mean, you, you should be your brother's keeper for goodness sake let them look inward and see how they can provide security for their immediate environment that is why uh, the igp at some point in time created this uh, community policing to make sure that you are the police of yourself you don't have to wait for a foreign government police police your area for you whatever you do you know will determine how well you can live in that area for soldiers that are being uh, that are being accused in the north uh, in Kaduna, uh, for for instance i the soldiers will not just go into a place and start killing people there must have been something that uh, probably led to that or necessitated that killing. Probably it was a reprisal attack by the soldiers, you know, to kill three people. They, because most times some of these stories are not reported, or some of these things happen to even the security agencies are not reported. The soldiers are, are being killed in the north too. You know, the life of a soldier is equally very important. The soldier, the soldiers, you know, a soldier comes from a family. He represents the family. So if his life is taken and you feel that he will just sit back and watch it because he doesn't want, uh, you know, his name to be carried or the institution to be, you know, to be portrayed in very bad light. No. The soldiers have lives to live to. I, I cannot sit back and watch my parents being killed. I would definitely want to fight back. And then they say it's 100 cows. How? Are they now selling cows? You know, some of these things can be reported because they want to give, uh, kill a dog because they want to give the dog a bad name. I don't think that story is right to some extent. Something would have led to that reprisal attack. The soldiers will not just go to a place and start killing people instead of protecting the people in which uh, they were constitutionally sent to protect. Now, you also mentioned one of the significant solutions or one of the many options that uh, the North can explore in finding lasting solutions to an end to such reoccurrences. You mentioned community policing. Yeah. Uh, I remember at the start of the first quarter this year, there was also a state dialogue on uh, state policing as well. But there were different opinions as to how ready the Nigerian state is for state policing. But with this growing need to have internal security, especially in areas that are hard to reach. Do you think that this conversation needs to be expedited more or into this development? Uh, I'm not looking at uh, state policing per se. Uh, all I'm looking at is uh, the community creating a security network within more itself. More like a community watch? Yes, yes, and not necessarily relying on the government to provide security. You know, look in what, I know that when the uh, insurgency started in the north, the, there was something like uh, community policing, vigilante, and all that. If you can create that within your system, or within your enclave, it will enable you to manage who comes in to the community and who leaves the community per time. I don't believe that if the proper the community, uh, we have a community policing in place, infiltrators can just come into society and kill the monarch who is supposed to be the head of that society at that time. It's a something wrong. There's a disconnect. Unless there's an insider arrangement, or the society itself, or the community itself was porous, as a result of which this book could come in, you know. But if you have community policing, and you know who probably who say individuals cannot withstand the fire powers of the infiltrators, you can now if you have the nexus with the uh, government uh, security system, you can get in touch with the government to provide more, uh, you know, more security to cushion the effect or to make sure that these people are probably arrested or the excesses are checked. Unless there must be something wrong somewhere for somebody, a stranger or a visitor to come into a community to kill people. It doesn't just happen that way. I don't think uh, state policing or state police is necessary at this time because institutions must be independent you know, and must be equally seen to be independent for them to be given such responsibilities such as state policing. You know, let's still continue to play this unitary aspect of policing where the report is given to the IG who, you know, who gives uh, directives, otherwise we'll abuse it unless uh, 
we have uh, institutions that are strengthened. We have uh, we've reached a level of maturity where the, the political class will no longer be in charge of the police. And I think what is uh, probably uh, you know being looked at right now is the fact that when you see the way a manner governors within the state direct the affairs of the police, you will not want to support uh, state policing unless. Uh, we get to a level where political institutions and other government institutions are meant to, you know, are independent, where they can look inward and address itself, you know, cushion itself from vices and external influence. Then we can uh, be ripe enough to have uh, state, state policing. Police. But for now, what we I think we should immediately look at is community policing. Now, an interesting perspective as it greets the discussion of how to solve Nigeria's security challenges associated to banditry particularly in the north. Now, away from this, uh, coming down to the south, has been a report by the Punch newspaper this morning of a difference in opinion. Whilst the Minister of Work Engineer David Umwahi insists that the government is paying compensation to landowners along the coastal highway, some landowners have moved to sue the federal government over the construction of the 15 trillion Naira Lagos Calabar Coastal Highway. Let's revisit the front page of the Punch newspaper and get perspectives to this story. Now, on the Punch newspaper, you'd find the lead story, Landowners Sue FG over 15 trillion Nara Lagos Calabar Highway. Mwahi vows to continue project, insists government paying compensation. FG rules out new roads in 2025, plans to complete existing projects. Now, it did garner some media reactions earlier on when talks about the EIA and the replies from the minister at a media parley went viral. Now, in some months down the line, work has begun in some quarters. But according to this report, many say the adequate compensation has not been paid. Now, and it's become a legal matter. At, at this point, how does the federal government move forward? Persons have talked about some of the relevant road projects that are needed. And one of such is the Costa Calabar Highway. But people are asking... Is it being done at the right time? Would this administration be able to complete it before they leave office? The, that project is so massive, Herculean, and uh, you know it's quite uh, demanding. But looking at the headline now, you discover that the people who are suing the government are not suing the government because they're not probably being compensated. For instance, if you have a house that you value at, let's say, 15 million, and they are given 1 million, uh, it's an aberration. People will not be satisfied. And most times, uh, what the government does is forcing, you know, some of these persons who uh, ordinarily would have been compensated adequately with, with, with peanut, you know, not with proper negotiation. You know, for every business transaction, you have to negotiate. It must be this offer, acceptance, intention to create legal relationships and other rights in a contract law. But in the situation where you impose a certain amount of money, based on your whims and caprices or based on what you feel is it's good for, the for that. and not what the person actually wants. You know, that is what is leading to, to this uh, bad blood or suing the government for that. They're not doing it because they're not being compensated or there's no plan to compensate them or there are no plans to compensate them. They're doing this because what they are getting in return from government is peanut compared to the actual value of what you know, has been put in place or will be lost at the end of it as a result of this. Yes, the road is going to be for the benefit of the people along the coastal uh, route, you know. But how well have they been compensated? What is to be given to these persons that will be classified as proper compensation for losing their valuable assets is what has necessitated or led to suing the government for an improper compensation. It's as simple as that. If there's proper negotiation between the government and the people who occupy some of these routes, I don't think uh, it will get to a level where we'll start taking the government to court for non-compensation. The right thing should be done. The people should be called. There should be you know, town hall meetings to value some of the annual committees must have been put in place to value you know, some of those assets along the coastal line to make sure that uh, these persons are compensated. But who determines what should be given to who and why? That is what matters right now. Now, another interesting strapline accompanying that headline story was the comments on no new road projects will be entertained in 2025. And I'm very sure some states and other areas where the debates of which road is a federal road, which road is a state road, have already continued to ensue. Particularly the Calabar Highway, the Calabar um, Itu Highway linking a Kwaibom to Cross River State has been one of such debates. 
Well, uh, that road uh, to me is an eyesore right now because it's not passable. I know we've recorded so many accidents or incidences along that road there. Or the criminal element will come and block the road because of uh, some of those uh, bad spots. Looking at that place, because that's where I come from, it's pr probably my, my base or my main concern because I use that road a lot. But if you pass through that road, you will discover that something urgent needs to be done. Good enough, the Senate president is from there, and I think uh, uh, he has to look into that road. Because, but in some cases, we heard that the contracts, uh, that awarded contracts for the construction of that road to some contractors. What happened? These persons should be questioned. This is how these persons will be awarded this contract, they will abandon everything and go, nothing happens. Should we continue to talk about Calabar to road Calabar? How big is the road that we, we can't even finish in one year? That every time we're referring or making references to Calabar to road, and people are wrong, along that axis are, uh, you know, are suffering. It's, it's, uh, it goes to show that uh, something is wrong somewhere. And the, uh, is it investigative panel? Is that how they're called? Or some of these uh, persons, especially from the Ministry of Works, that have been put in place to check the excesses of uh, contractors are really not doing their job. They go there for oversight visits and functions, get compensated, come out, give positive reports. And then the contractor goes away with it because he's, the, people, the people that were sent to check, to checkmate some of the excesses of these contractors have compromised. You, know, you cannot go there your, your paid money and you laugh, go to your hotel, enjoy yourself, at the end of the day, you come back to criticize it because you've sold your hands, you've lost, you know, the check or the, your powers to check, you know, whoever is going uh, contrary to the principles or the contract uh, terms because you've compromised. That has been what is playing out in this country and it's affecting us as a people and we cannot grow unless we change that, uh, we, you know, we get a reorientation about, you know, how to live. But it goes to show that, uh, the economic policies or economic uh, indices in this country are so terrible that everybody wants to survive, irrespective of who is hot or who is touched. Some persons compromise even at the, their responsibilities simply just for peanuts, just because they want to survive or they want to be able to live and uh, probably meet up their needs at the time. That is the problem. That is the nucleus of some of these compromises and you know, not people not carrying out their duties or functions uh, you know, assigned to them. The government should wake up to its responsibilities and put economic policies, you know, that will help us to live better lives. Nigerians are suffering, but it's actually the terrible state that we need to come out of. Now, some of the sufferings of Nigerians and in ventilating these grievances have led to protests. The most recent one was the hashtag End Bad Governance protest, which held at the start of this month. There are also threats from civil society organizations that should the current situation in regards to the cost of living crisis not be addressed, on October 1st, Nigerians might again hit the streets. Now, whilst this has been the case in exercising uh, the constitutional rights to protest, some protesters have found themselves in the police net. Now, their release has become a headline story on the Vanguard. Now, let's look at the Vanguard newspapers. We revisit this case of... Uh, the legalities of protest and how to obtain release of those who are arrested in the process. On the Vanguard this morning, the lead story has hashtag end bad governance. Release detained protesters noun says Onai Yeka, Arewa Youths, CSOs. Now, also beneath that, uh, uh, a strap line reads uh, six NSAS protesters regain freedom four years later. Now, in putting this in perspective, uh, when the hashtag NSAS protest, before we come to end bad governance, happened, there was also that difference in positions of where persons arrested, the people lose their lives, panels were constituted to look into the matter. But four years after now, we're seeing some persons regaining freedom, having spent four years of their lives in detention. Now, there are calls on Human Rights uh, uh, Commission to look into the matter. But whilst that is the case, the most recent one now has another call from certain CEOs asking for groups of persons to be released who were detained following their involvement in protests. Uh, let's get perspective on how this is supposed to work and what the position of these groups are in terms of persons who get arrested during protests. Well, if anyone is arrested because he's protesting, it's an aberration, it's uh, an infringement on the person's fundamental right because as a human person, as a citizen, especially as a citizen of Nigeria, I have the right to protest. Nobody can stop me from protesting or if the government is doing anything that is contrary 
you know, that uh, there is least expected of the government that they do not have the right to protest. And if you detain, arrest, and detain somebody, you come out, to, uh, you know, on air to say nobody was arrested or no one is detained. It means that the government is insensitive to the yearnings or plights of Nigerians. But I want to draw attention to the fact that uh, nobody should be arrested or detained unnecessarily you know, due to his or her participation in any protest in this country. It's a universal right, it's, you know, that is. Even the Amnesty International, I saw a release recently asking that all protesters be released because it's a universal right, which gives every citizen the right or the opportunity to protest against policies of government that are at variance with uh, good living. But it's shocking that some persons were arrested four years ago and are being released now. I'm not aware of that. But the government, through its propagandist machinery, had come up at some point in time to say no one was killed or people were not arrested, no one is detained. So who are the people that are being released now? Why are they released now? It's a fundamental right against this person if they're actually arrested and detained for four years. And they have the right to approach the court, to, you know, to make sure that uh, their rights to human person or human or good living is uh, protected. But for people who have been arrested in the recent protest, I don't think it's the right thing to be done. The government should... It's a matter of uh, urgency to release this person so that they do not put their names in very bad light. But take note of the fact that even the government or the president, uh, the president now, you know, had sponsored some protests in the past against Jonathan government and previous the government. Occupy Nigeria protests. Yeah, yeah, and nothing happened. You know, they were allowed because the government at that time recognized the fact that it's a universal right to protest and nothing happened. People were not arrested. But if people are being arrested right now, it means uh, there's something wrong somewhere. It's uh, an error. It's an aberration of uh, good governance. And I'll therefore use the opportunity to ask that uh, whoever has been arrested in connection with the uh, NBAD government or NSAS should be released immediately. It's an, it's an order. It's an appeal to the government in place because it's contrary to you know our rights to existence you know, as human persons. And that's not what uh, the law presupposes. You know, they should be released immediately. That's my own position. Another group of individuals who have called for more protection in their attempt to be able to cover and report incidences are journalists, some of who the Vanguard reports are calling on uh, the government and well-meaning organizations to lend their voices for the protection of journalists in line with coverage of news events, particularly in the events of protests. I think uh, in the last uh, protest, some persons had complained as a result of which I think either the police or government agencies ordered or asked or appealed that if you're a journalist covering a particular protest, you should have your identity, you know, to separate you from the protesters so that whoever is coming or whoever wants to arrest will know that, well, this is a journalist who is carrying out his uh, lawful duty. I think it's a problem of identity. But in some cases, you see some policemen or some security agencies, you know, out of excitement or whatever, over zealousness, do certain things contrary to what they were asked to do, probably going contrary to the directives from their bosses, you know, from those who have sent them to do those things. It is not a government that is asking them to do that. They are over excited or over zealous as a result of which they go and start shooting people or start harassing people who are protesting without recourse to the fact that even the protesters are fighting to better their lots. Because they are equally in, in as far as you are in this country, you should be even as a security man or a security woman, should be facing what other Nigerians are facing. And that is why bribery cannot be contained in this country because everybody wants to survive, including policemen. They equally want to survive. Army, too. Soldiers want to survive. So who will not want to survive? The fact that you're, you have access to the gun doesn't mean that you will not eat or you don't have a family you know, that will look up to you, you know, for their means of livelihood. So everybody is being affected, apart from the ruling class right now in this country. Everybody has one problem or the other, and I think... Uh, even those who are fighting protests should be very careful in doing that because uh, at some point in time, the rain does not fall on one, it falls on every roof. If your father does not suffer it, your mother will suffer it. If your mother doesn't suffer it, your family members will equally suffer it. So they should be careful in carrying out some of these directives given to them by government. I'm not saying they should go contrary to what their bosses or whatever they've been assigned to, but not to go contrary or go uh, above what they've been asked to do, you know, to give the government a bad name. Now, in wrapping up our review of local newspapers this morning, we have time just to squeeze in one more paper, and that will be the Business Day paper. Now, on the Business Day earlier, we looked at a report that uh, the prices of certain staple foods in Nigeria have declined for the first time in 18 months. And uh, the likes of Gary potatoes were captured in that report on the Business Day. Uh, let's look at it again. 
on the business day this morning. We had earlier looked at it. Cost of living crisis eases as prices of gari, potato, tomato drop. Now, many complain about uh, where inflation is and how it's also been occasioned by the CBN's decision to jack up the uh, NPR. Now, as much as many families cannot really afford some of the staple foods, the likes of rice particularly, now we're looking at this report that potatoes and gari have dropped in recent time. Uh, are there hopes that the government's intervention, which many have said would not be sustainable through free import duties for importation of more grains, uh, is, is being greeted by this review by the Business Day? Your projections, you come from an agrarian state. Gary is one of the major exports from that part of the country. Let's get your perspective on this report. Uh, let me be particular. Let me be specific. I'm an Ambube man. I come from Ambube in Ogoja, local government area of Krasova State. And we produce a lot of Gary. You know, when I traveled to Mbube recently, where I come from, where I was born and, you know, bred, I discovered that the price of Gary had dropped from the initial, uh, is it 35, 40,000 to 21,000, low as 21,000. Potato and other things have dropped. I think what the government needs to do at this time is to see how uh, they, you know, it can, in, you know, get involved in financing agriculture, even at the rural areas. It's not all about giving people bags of rice or trucks of uh, truck loads of rice. See how you can, you know, support these uh, farmers. Don't fight them because what the previous government did that made uh, farmers happy was this, the fact that there is uh, they call it funding of agricultural processes and all that. You know, made sure that we had enough food to eat despite the end. How do you call it? Uh, uh, what is uh, how do you call it? This uh, 2019 uh, saga, this epidemic, how do you call it? COVID, COVID and the rest, yeah, that COVID era. We're able to survive it because the government decided to fund agriculture through the CBN uh, and then the NASA Microfinance Bank, even the World Bank. The government should help to cushion the effect on Nigerians by making sure that farmers want, first of all, security, security of farmers, uh, the lives and properties of farmers are protected. And then secondly, they are funded, fertilizer, all these uh, improved agricultural, uh, uh, you know, what do you call it, inputs are made available to enable, to enable the farmers to return to farm. If these things are provided, then the farmer will be in for it. Because as it stands right now, the prices of food items have actually gone down. And there's another thing again the government must do to improve agricultural production is to make sure that the refineries in Nigeria work. That is one thing that shut up inflation. If we can make sure that the refineries work and the prices of petrol, petroleum products are brought down, it will make sure that the lives of Nigerians you know, get better. Because you cannot, uh, you don't expect a farmer to spend so much to go to Mbube, where I come from, to go and bring agricultural produce. You know, at the expense of his existence, you know, eating to his capital or not make profit at the end of the day. If transportation is well provided, goods will get to the, you know, from the rural areas to the cosmopolitan uh, cities or urban areas without much stress. And uh, at the end of the day, the end user, which is the consumer, will not be taxed or will not be, you know, charged so much because, you know, the farmer too is being provided incentives to make sure that these things get to the, the rightful persons. And if, once this thing is done, I think that uh, petroleum products, security, these are two major uh, things that will make sure that the price of food will continue to go down because everybody wants to survive. People want to eat. That, that's one way of curbing some of these excesses taking place and then some of these protests. Because if you don't eat, you're hungry. Say, a hungry man is an angry man. If I'm hungry, I'll be moved. I'll be easily moved or encouraged to join this protest. But if I'm comfortable that I'm eating well, I will not think of a protest because I feel at that point that the government is doing its best to make sure that uh, things get better. Well, we must thank you for your time on the program and your objectivity to reviewing issues in the news. We appreciate you. Thank you very much. The pleasure is mine. So it's a homecoming, coming to identify with you and making sure that Nigerians are properly schooled or educated on the happenings in this country.